During his brief life, a mere 35 years, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart composed almost 700 works and wrote more than 1,000 letters. These figures are extraordinary enough, especially in view of the genius quality of the musical works that have come down to us. The letters aren't bad either. But there is another amazing aspect of his career, exceptional even in the musical life of the 18th century, and that is the extent of the distances he was forced to travel. He had to do it because he needed to find regular employment. Milan, Rome, Naples, Mannheim, Paris, Prague, Berlin, Frankfurt. These are just some of the places he visited. And it begs the question, when did the man get any sleep at all? Before he was 10 years of age, Mozart had spent almost half his life on the road, crammed into carriages with his family that were drafty and dusty and sometimes damp, like this one. You couldn't find a musician nowadays that would put up with quite such a crazy schedule. Oh, mind you, travel nowadays can be just as uncomfortable in its own way, but at least it's a whole lot quicker. The Mozart family's first grand tour of Europe lasted three years. Setting out from Salzburg on the 9th of June, 1763, they first stopped off in Leopold's hometown of Augsburg where they picked up a traveling piano. Slowly, often arduously, they made their way from royal court to royal court, from tavern to tavern, often enough to a coach breakdown in the middle of the woods. But nothing fazed them. The family continued on via Frankfurt to Paris and then moved through Brussels, arriving at the port of Calais on the English Channel in the spring of 1764. This leg of the journey took them some 11 months, during which the children had given over 30 performances in Europe's greatest courts. Nano, Mozart's 11-year-old sister, played the piano. Wolfgang, an accomplished switch hitter even at the tender age of eight, alternated between the violin, the piano and the organ. Leopold's prime responsibility, besides doing the schedules and paying the bills, was to make sure everybody arrived in one piece. The interaction between musical instruments had already begun to fascinate little Wolfgang, as we can hear in this very early work, his sonata for piano and violin K9. Note how the two instruments take turns accompanying one another. A remarkable approach for a composer of any age. Previously, pieces like these were called violin sonatas and the keyboard instruments merely accompanied the violin. The development of the piano, however, offered new possibilities and the budding composer eagerly took advantage of them. The channel crossing was a real sensation for the children. I have seen the ebb and the flow of the sea, how three horses were landed from the ship, and how the ship herself was launched into the water, wrote Nanel in her travel diary. But this journey was anything but the merry adventure the children described. The turbulence of the channel had its usual effect on poor Leopold. We could not pass over these waters without great quantities of retching, which admittedly spared us the expense of emetics. At present, thank the Lord, we are all hale and hearty. Thrifty Leopold saw a bargain, even in seasickness. A born social critic, he had something to say about everything in England. And this is what he wrote a friend about the climate. As England is an island, it suffereth greatly from the constant change of winds blowing in from the sea. 
Each day one may experience a grim heat, followed but a quarter hour thereafter with a grim chill. On English clothing, he had this to say. The whole nation seems attired for a masquerade. How do you think my wife and little girl look in English hats, or myself and my big Wolfgang in English clothes? Like so many visitors, before and since, Leopold had little fondness for British food. The comestibles are extraordinary nourishing, substantial and hearty. And how the local citizenry greedily gobble up fat, not only when it is warm, but also when it is congealed. In a word, they eat like savages. The first place the Mozart stayed was the home of a hairdresser in Cecil Court, between the two opera houses in the Haymarket and Covent Garden. This location certainly served Leopold's purpose of housing his family as close as possible to the nobility, and they all loved the city. The illumination here is the loveliest and most extensive I have ever laid eyes on. More than 55,435 lamps. Typical Leopold again, the born statistician. Moving the family from one city to the next was a major operation. But then, Leopold was a natural organizer. Still, you have to ask yourself, why did he drag his wife and his two children halfway across Europe to London? It was tiring, it was expensive. But in Paris, they had told him that a visit to London was vital. Why? In the second half of the 18th century, London was in the process of expanding into the great world capital we know today. George III was on the throne, giving his name to a true golden age in which foreign conquests brought the nation elegance and luxury. Cultural life witnessed a true halcyon era in a period that spawned such luminaries as Reynolds and Gainsborough, Goldsmith and Blake, and countless others. The country's colonial empire was steadily on the increase, especially in the territories across the Atlantic, greatly enlarged by the successful outcome of the French and Indian Wars the previous year, in which a young colonel by the name of George Washington had served with distinction. It was this self-satisfied England that would soon find it impossible to understand why the American colonists could possibly want to sever their ties with them or refuse to pay their taxes. In fact, the finest mind of the age, Dr. Samuel Johnson, would write a scathing attack called Taxation, No Tyranny, castigating the Americans for what he considered the vilest form of sedition. But the London of 1764 was still the kind of town where every prospect pleases. A new bridge spanned the Thames. New shopping areas with roofed terraces altered the city's image. And as the city grew, it swallowed up the outlying country towns and transformed them into suburbs. This was the London Leopold had brought his family to. He always had a good nose for the main chance. Now I find myself with a few months in which I shall have plenty to do, getting the noblesse on my side. It will cost me much galloping about and great effort. When he got to France on this journey, Leopold ran across a boyhood friend who was now working in Paris as a copper engraver. He immediately commissioned an artist named Carmontello to paint a portrait of himself and the two children and had his friend make a plate to print handbills advertising the arrival of his phenomenal family. Well, today performers leave eight by 10 glossies in agents' offices. For Leopold, winning over the aristocracy was the key to achieving all his plans. He knew his own future and his sons would depend on help from high places. His own position as assistant conductor in Salzburg was far too lowly for his liking, which led him to seek a better position for his son at one of Europe's great courts. Leopold was well aware of the old boy network linking the various European courts. He used letters of recommendation from one court to gain entry to another. The more favor he carried in these seats of power, the better he saw the chances for his family's enterprises. 
Leopold's mission in life was to turn his Wunderkind into a first-class famous composer and to enable him to obtain, as early as possible, instruction from the best musicians in Europe. He made that his life's work. Indeed, he had even transferred his own professional ambitions to his son, while continuing to dream of fame, respect, and wealth for himself and his family. This explained his determination to take advantage of the sensation of a talented toddler to gain entry to the highest echelons of European society and, by extension, to the high places of European musical life. The first and most important phase of Leopold's plan was a performance for the king and queen here at Kew Palace. He must have been some publicist, because he actually managed to book the family, so to speak, into the palace, only three days after their arrival in London. Music had always played an important part in George III's family life. The 27-year-old monarch was now in the fourth year of a reign which would last another 55 and in the third year of his marriage to Princess Charlotte Sophia of Mecklenburg-Strelitz. The queen sang and played the piano quite tolerably for a queen, as Haydn later noted. She had a great passion for the opera. Music was also an important part of the king's life. He often took long walks here in the gardens of Kew Palace whistling tunes by his favorite composer, George Friedrich Handel. And so it was no coincidence that Wolfgang was asked to play a Handel suite, and what's more, he had to sight read it. Not even Leopold could have dreamed his children would be such a success. In fact, the children were so successful, they were asked to appear at court three more times. Leopold's letter of recommendation strategy may have got them in the door, but it was their talent that got them invited back. Everything proceeded to the full satisfaction of the royal couple, the public advertiser reported. Leopold seemed satisfied not only with a handsome fee of 50 guineas, but also with... The friendliness and indescribable graciousness, accorded his little Wolfgang. What Wolfgang knew when we left Salzburg is but a pale shadow of what he knows now. It quite defies the imagination. Handel had spent 30 years in London, where he died five years before the Mozart's visit. In that same season, no less than seven of his oratorios were performed. Mozart may have heard one of them, probably the ever-popular Messiah. But now another composer was calling the tune in London, the youngest son of the immortal Bach, Johann Christian, the Queen's music master and musical director of the Haymarket Opera. Nana later wrote of her brother's first meeting with him. Bach took Wolfgang on his lap, and the two of them took turns playing the piano for some two hours without interruption, all in the presence of the king and the queen. J.C. Bach's music had many characteristics of the Italian style, an unusual attribute for someone initially trained in the German school. But London, like everywhere else in Europe, was heavily influenced by Italian culture. Italian composers and singers were the darlings of the city. In his early youth, Bach, who had been trained by members of the family, parted company with familiar styles and moved on to Italy, spending a number of years in Milan, where he converted to Roman Catholicism to qualify for a job as cathedral organist. In Milan, he learnt the more graceful, melodic Italian style and made a name for himself throughout the country. His London reputation was largely based on his operatic compositions. It was an influence which could not fail to affect Mozart in his formative years. Temperamentally, he was closer to the spirit of the Italian style than to the more austere musical influences of Northern Europe. And it was the cosmopolitan Bach, more than anyone else, who introduced the child composer to a new world of musical invention. It was the start of Mozart's lifelong admiration for the older man, an admiration that would find reflection in the younger composer's music. Now that's a quotation, not from Mozart, but from a J.C. Bach overture. Possibly this is Mozart's homage to his friend and teacher. After all, he wrote this concerto around the time he heard of Bach's death. 
Today, J.C. Bach is remembered, among other things, for being the father of the piano concerto, and his compositions provided Mozart with a blueprint for his own piano concertos later on. But let's not forget, he absorbed all of this when he was still only nine years old, and we're talking about a child. What it produced years later was a richness of melodic invention still unsurpassed in the history of music. His Viennese audiences loved it, and today the enthusiasm is still as strong as it was all those years ago. When Bach got to London, he also became one of the world's first musical impresarios. In a partnership with a friend of the Bach family from Germany, composer Karl Friedrich Abel, he operated a series called the Bach Abel Concerts. Bach and Abel's music must have made an indelible impression on the young Mozart who heard lots of it that season. Little Wolfgang was fascinated by both these musicians and set to work studying their compositional technique assiduously. He completed one of Christian Bach's fugues, performing the assigned theme without any difficulty and without a single mistake. He wrote down one of Abel's symphonies in his copybook. And their styles must have been so similar that 100 years later, Mozart scholars had such a hard time telling the difference, they simply entered these transcriptions into the Köchel catalog.
If the 64-65 concert season was glorious, the opera season was glamour unbounded. Some of the greatest Italian and German artists appeared that year. The Italian impresario invited the Mozarts to his home and introduced them to most of the visiting artists. Many of them became good friends, whom Wolfgang often met again on his travels. With so much new opera, it's hardly surprising that young Wolfgang wanted to compose one himself. But if you want to write an opera, you've got to know something about the voice. So he took singing lessons from the world-famous castrato Manzvoli. And for years afterwards, to sing like Manzvoli was a catchphrase in the Mozart family. Wolfgang wrote a lively tenor aria. And although music like this seemed to pour out of the nine-year-old with ease, there have always been people, now as much as then, who, when confronted by a child genius, become suspicious. But a good ad campaign always did take the steam out of the critics and further a musician's career. Still, their days as the toasts of London were limited. Gone were the fancy concert halls, replaced by rented rooms and taverns. The Wunderkinder weren't making headlines anymore. Announcements of their appearances began sounding like publicity for a sideshow attraction at a county fair. There will be musical performances every day between midday and 3 p.m. in the great hall of the Swan and Hall. The children will play four-handed on the same keyboard with a handkerchief over their hands so they cannot see the keys. And isn't that exactly what you'd ask Mozart to do if you met him? Play with a handkerchief over his hands? A few weeks later, the family left London, never to return. On the way back, they stopped over in Canterbury. To visit the famous cathedral? No, to check out the horse races. So, how important was London to Mozart in the following years? His contact with J.C. Bach, with the opera and the stimulating concert life, the dozens of musicians and composers from all over Europe, all of this must have been enormously useful to him. And it was useful later in adult life when he met many of his former London contacts in Italy, Germany, France, and elsewhere. His friendship with J.C. Bach was certainly significant, and it lasted until the end of Bach's life, even though they met again on only one occasion in Paris. Here were two musicians linked by one musical form, the piano concerto. These concertos had become enormously popular throughout Europe. Listen to this. 
These concertos are a happy medium between what is too easy and too difficult. They are very brilliant, pleasing to the ear and natural, without being vapid. There are passages here and there from which the connoisseurs alone can derive satisfaction, but these passages are written in such a way that the less learned cannot fail to be pleased, though without knowing why. The author of these words clearly knew what he was talking about, and he should. After all, that was a quote from Mozart himself. Interestingly enough, this concerto represents one of the major links in the flow of music history from early times to the present day. Just as J.C. Bach was influenced both by his illustrious family and his intensive studies in Italy, going on to serve as one of Mozart's many compositional influences, so too the link between this concerto and the work of the young Beethoven has struck more than one scholar. But even more important than all these historical factors is the sheer brilliance of a great musician at the height of his powers, drawing from whatever inspiration he needed to compose music for the ages. <laughs>